Hello, everyone. My name is Mohammed. Uh, I'll be presenting my capstone project that I did I shared in college, which is a code injection uh, cyber range. So a little thing, I, a little stuff that I planned out for today is I'll talk a little bit about, about myself, the methodology and why I chose the topic, uh, two examples, threat hijacking and Windows API hooking, future goals for how the project, and some future example that I want to go through as well, and we'll go through Q&A. So a little bit about me. Uh, I graduated from Sheridan College just a few weeks ago in uh, information and system security. Uh, I also did my co-op at Sheridan College as a network administrator, where I did configuration management and other stuff like that. So, and a little bit about the project. So code injection cyber range is a uh, cyber range for like uh, environment for virtual environments for running malware for mainly for this project was meant for students who couldn't access uh, other ones online that are behind a paywall. So the difference between mines and the ones online where some that are free and available and are open source, where some online are not as interactive or engaging for the audience and the students who are wanting to learn more about code injection and how malware is functioning. Some examples that I found on our red team were simple with you have an IDE, you're running uh, Visual Studio, you run the code and you have to interact with the code and look at a uh, process hacker and do some basic stuff here and there. For mine, it's like more of the capture flag type of style where you're using different tools, different methods, and whatever you learn in school to apply into the real world. So one uh, example that I did was uh, thread hijacking. So this is where you have a target process and you take it over with another process with, with malicious code. And from there, you can run malicious code through remote process. So here on IRA team, they simply have a, you use, simply they have a, a process ID where you have to manually put into the code. And as you're debugging through the code, it will change and you'll have a memory location, which will have a remote, you have a shell, reverse shell code there for the user to view and compare with the code and in the memory location. And here, is, this is simple step by step where you have, you open the code, you launch it, you open Process Hacker, you put in the Process ID from Process Hacker into the code, and once you change the code, you click on the debug and it'll execute, and then you'll get a memory address location within with Visual Studio, and then you can compare the code from the memory address location within Visual Studio to the actual code within to compare the reverse shell. Uh, in my example, it's a little bit more different where it's like a capture flag where the user executes a PDF file in this case where it opens up a shell code a console and then you and it'll give you like uh, it'll key log and do other stuff as well. So here as uh, soon as uh, we open the open the PDF file, It opens up Notepad and it opens up uh, Process Hacker and you have a command line open up as well. So here, uh, you, what this is what, what it's gonna do is you can enter a bunch of stuff in Notepad and go through the console. You can type in a bunch of numbers or letters and as I'm, as I'm typing in through here, nothing is really happening. No, no numbers do anything. And then what happens from here is that I'll search in Process Hacker to find out the, what is the process ID for Notepad. And from there, it'll, the code will continue to execute the way it is intended. Okay. Yeah, so here's also the key logger. So you're just gonna type in hello world and I'm typing in my name as well. Like, my name is Mohammed, And then here, we'll find the process ID for Notepad. We'll go to the memory module, which will then display what is the, uh, where we'll go into memory to find out a certain uh, hidden address. Okay. Yeah, so as soon as we type in the process ID, we have a message block being displayed with the, with the memory address location and a hint notifying us that there is a change in the user directory. So what I'll do is I'll keep the message box open and I'll go into the memory module location. So from here, 
I'm going to scroll down as close as possible to the memory address location or the exact memory address location uh, or as close as possible and see if, if the reverse shell is actually at that memory address location. Yeah, so here we can see that this is uh, the correct memory address location where is a, the reverse shell being displayed in memory. To verify this, there's two files that also get created when you enter the correct process uh, ID for Notepad. So here we'll go into the user directory. And from here we can, I, you can notice that there's a two files that are being created. One is a hash file and one is a readme file. The readme file is a key lock file which all the keys are being uh, logged into and which is supposed to sh uh, send over the really turn it over to the threat actor's uh, computer. And then we have the hash file in here which we can compare in memory and the exact, uh, in the notepad we can compare the two notepad, uh, two memory address locations and the exact shell code that's in the location. So another example that I did was a Windows API where we, you have the original function in memory and you patch it to a hooked function. And from there you have a proxy function which then is used by the threat actor to run malicious code from uh, intercepting um, the functions from, win, uh, from inbuilt APIs. So on IRA team, the example was as simple as just having a message bot being popped up and then saying, hi, this, this memory address has been hooked. This is for, on this message box. And then it gives you only the memory address location in Visual Studio and not in a prompt to like help the user or like give the user hints to like where to go, what tools to use and other stuff like that. And some, there's a message that they give is of, they have a message in memory hidden by using a write process to memory. In my example here, I have a, another example where here it does similar things, but there's two hidden uh, messages in memory. Okay. So in this example, we have a game that someone pirated called Black Myth Wukong. And from there, once you open the application, it's going to do something similar to from before, where it opens up a command line. And, but in this case, you have a bunch of gibberish text being displayed and nothing else given or opening. So then from here, what you, the user has to do is try to guess through what keys or what numbers can uh, give them the hint or do something. So here we're just pressing a bunch of numbers and then when you press two, it closes the, uh, closes the application. So pressing two closes it. So then by reopening it, I know two is gonna close it, so I'll press one. By pressing one, there is a, there's a hint saying, please just press something to continue. But as doing nothing happens, so what, what we can do is scroll up to see if there's any hidden messages after I press one. So I, do the, I press one again and I scroll up. And then here, once you scroll far enough, there is gonna be a hint for the user. It says notepad is not running. So in this case, I'm gonna open up notepad and then rerun the program again to see what changes. And now I'm gonna scroll back up from doing that as well. So and there's only two options where one is uh, have notepad open and two is to close the application. Yeah. So I'll press one again. And from here, I will open up Notepad, and then I will press any key to continue. And then I'm going to scroll right back up to see if there are any more messages or any other hidden messages for me to look at to go further on for this process. Here we have uh, two messages being given to me where a load library function has been hooked into one address. And then also at another address, there is a hidden message. So from here, what, what, what the user has to do is use the tools that they have learned throughout the program. Like you can use Process Hacker and other, and any other tool that you can view uh, um, memory. So here I'll open up Process Hacker and I'll look up Notepad. I'll search up Notepad, I'll open up and go into the memory address location. 
the same process applies where I have to go to the similar memory address location as well and then closest as possible or the exact same one. I'll start by going to the, the message memory address location first. Yeah, as soon as I find it, he, there's a message saying, hey, you found me, notifying the user that this is the correct memory address location that they found. And the next one is going to be a little bit more tricky, as it's not exact memory address location given in the memory, memory addresses given that are mapped out for Notepad. So in this case, I have to find out that the one is the next closest one. And in this case, when if I just skip through a little bit. If I find the next closest one, which is going to be around this one right here, ending in 100, then I'm going to scroll down as much as possible to find the last five bytes that match in memory. And from there, what I can do is assume that those last five bytes in this memory address location match where load library A is being hooked into Notepad, which is a being as which is allowing the user to do malicious, which is allowing the threat actor to do malicious things uh, in the background. So some future goals that I have for this project is uh, doing it in different languages. Some languages that I found that are really interesting and have more offensive uses to it are Rust and Go. So I, what I want to do is turn these examples I've done and use it into Go as it is quite very, very interesting. And I found a very particular example that uses Go and that is still undetected uh, till, this, till today. So by using, there's a GitHub profile that I found that uses offensive Go, and it uses a very interesting libraries to where it goes undetected for antivirus systems for Microsoft. So here it's a simple re uh, reverse shell that's being, on, being executed and payloaded and downloaded into the victim's machine uh, through, a virtual, through, through virtual machines that we have here. Once the, user has down, uh, once the user has downloaded the reverse shell unex unexpectedly on their behalf, there is obscuration done on the code uh, from the from threat actor's side to prevent the antivirus system from detecting it. And it d uses a technique where it does multiple threat, multiple threat, mani threat manipulation to prevent it from being detected by the uh, antivirus. Here you can see that running it in Windows PowerShell, you're executing the DLL file, and you're trying to bypass the, fire, uh, the bypass the firewall. And in case it is bypassing a firewall and any antivirus system in re in real life detection, and from there you, the user is able, uh, once the reverse shell is executed and is you can see the connection here is a simple go reverse shell, meaning that once output.exe has been executed, uh, a golang there's in Go, it's a, a connection has been secured. And then from there, the user is able, the threat actor is able to control the user's uh, computer in different ways by sending it malicious uh, intents throughout, uh, throughout, throughout the connection. Here, you can notice that also in Process Hacker, as well as on the VM, that there is, as the user is sending in Malicious uh, reverse, uh, malicious intent, and uh, executed on different threads, and it's being undetected on Process Hacker. And as a user, you can see the user is running different commands on the Kali Linux VM onto the user, and you can see in the background there is the user, the threat actor is able to track whatever the user is doing and view all his positions, where the mouse is, what keyboards, what keys are being pressed, and all that fun stuff. And once, as you continue, as the user continues throughout with the example, here you can see that the user has a administrative power, the threat has administrative power, and in explore.exe, once you go through enough with memory, you can see that there is a reverse shell that is possibly similar to exactly what the threat actor had in mind. Yeah, and once the exploit is, and then once you, and from here, the threat actor is also able to exploit multiple times after running the code, uh, after restarting it, shutting it down, and the user and the victim cannot escape uh, whatever the threat actor has done. And you can see if you go to Windows Event Viewer, if you want to find out exactly what files or what other information is being com uh, committed without the user, without the victim noticing. You can see, see there's a Golang 
proc on event viewer that is running on different times and is creating an update log and an upgrade log that is hiding, in fact, on updates. So hopefully what my intent for this whole project and my the group mates projects for this capstone project was that we can spread more cyber awareness and train other people in the industry, especially students who are new and upcoming and don't have much experience and are as exposed to malware that is, uh, I feel like that we should have been in uh, school. Thank you. Thank you. So um, we're running ahead of schedule, so we have time for questions. And uh, uh, if anyone has anything for Muhammad, um, and I bet he'd also be happy to talk about his program as well, <laughs> as well as his capstone project. Ah, somebody had their hand up? Oh, right at the bottom. Hi. What's the question? So in the, in the last example, Windows Defender was not able to catch this particular uh, threat as it was able to, by using threat manipulation in different ways that I'm still trying to understand how the user on GitHub I was actually able to bypass Windows Defender. So they used th uh, one thing I didn't understand, they used threat manipulation to spread out their application, their threat, their code into different processes. And from that, Windows Defender wasn't able to detect why, to be able to detect those type of obscurification for the code for this particular thread. And the other question is, uh, what's that, uh, what's that, what's that, uh, what's that that you compiled? It's called the Windows, or is that Windows Notepad? That was, that's Windows Notepad, that's inbuilt Windows Notepad, that's not, not a new Notepad that, that I created. It's just simple Notepad from Windows that's but being compromised. Yeah, so that's a process ID that belongs to Notepad when every single time you open a new process, Windows gives it a process ID. So if you open up Windows Explorer, File Explorer, Google, or whatever application you use, they all have the ID attached to it for a process. And that is what the user has to enter for the program to be able to compromise Notepad in that particular example to show step by step how threat actors are able to take over and compromise through different processes without the user being notified. Yeah. Yeah, is able to like help the user able to like get more able to understand how debugging and troubleshooting and mitigate threats on their own and other tools that they can research online. Yeah. Hi. Uh, will it be uh, available on GitHub? Will, will your group will be reviewing it? Maybe with guides for you know, like students because. Like I understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. I think for st the students here, they like what's going on in there. And I think you learn it from your courses. Yeah. They might not have the same courses from different schools. Well. So I and so since I have some code available right now on my GitHub, but that's not the uh, so that's not updated. As this one, I changed. I so the code that I took from my GitHub that I posted for this project from Sheridan, I changed it up for this particular. Uh, conference as I want to make it more interactive and more engaging and more interesting. So I still have to update this. I'm just, just finalizing a little bit more things here and there in the code, and then I'm gonna upload it, the new updated version onto my GitHub, which is, a, which is publicly available. Yeah. 